Welcome, welcome. This is Kim Addis from Frame of Mind Coaching, and I am the host of Resilience Radio, where I interview professionals who are experts at crushing the tough stuff. Today, I'm really excited about my guest because our guest is a person who, let's call it, is extremely aligned with my way of thinking. And in my opinion, that's not always easy to find. Uh, But I was introduced to someone named Nicole Sachs, by a friend, a coach, a mentor of mine who said, you need to check this out. And so um, before I introduce Nicole Sachs, what I want to do is I want to give the audience a journaling question to ponder and to journal about. Here's your question for the day. And if you want to send it to me, please do at Kim at frameofmindcoaching.com. But here is your question. Think about an important relationship in your life and ask yourself the following question. How can I improve that significant relationship? What can I do to be more present, to be more engaged, perhaps to be more giving, but to really fuel this relationship? So that is your question for the day. Send it to me if if you want for feedback and for an experience where someone can read and respond to your journal. So, Nicole, welcome. Thank you for having me, Kim. So, uh, let's kind of go back. I have been working with someone personally uh, for close to two years, actually, uh, where, you know, uh, let, let me go back even further than that. I run a coaching company, and the whole entire premise of my coaching company is that our clients, we work with the executive population, highly driven entrepreneurs, those people, we ask them to journal in a private and secure online journal while they are getting coached. So every week they get a journaling question or a prompt, and they journal. And every time they journal, their journal goes back to their coach who then reads and responds to the journal. And the purpose of this exercise is for under, for us to understand how their thinking is impacting everything in their lives, their professional yeah. lives, their relationships, everything. And so over the past two years, I have personally been working with someone on a goal of mine. So I've been journaling with them back and forth every day, every two days, whatever, and she's been responding. And interestingly enough, she came across you and said, you need to listen to this uh, audio series. It was like a five-part series on the relationship between journaling and eliminating chronic pain. So Nicole, that is your area of expertise. Welcome to this podcast and, and tell us how this all happened. Where did it start? Where did you come up with this? And how come we never found each other sooner? <laughs> I know. I mean, it's so aligned. Um, so if, I, if we're going to start at the very beginning, when I was 19, I was diagnosed with a condition called uh, severe degenerative spondylolisthesis, which means that there um, is a structural abnormality in my lower spine. It looks very uh, terrifying on MRI. And I was referred to, or I I was in severe chronic pain in my lower back. And I was referred to orthopedic surgeons who told me that my life would be significantly limited. So I was, uh, would probably have no biological children. I shouldn't exercise. I shouldn't travel. I needed to sleep in very specific positions. I shouldn't ride in a car for more than an hour. I was 19 years old. It was a very, very significant, um, diagnosis and, uh, and, and advice from physicians on how my, the rest of my life was going to look. And, um, there was something in me, you know, kind of like in the back of like the little fire behind my mind that said, this can't, this can't possibly be the only answer because, you know, they did say you could eventually have spinal fusion surgery. Um, but there was no guarantee that it would work, that it would take away your pain. And there was also, um, decreased mobility for life because they put a rod in your spine and I was 19 and they said, you know, nobody would, would uh, recommend that for a 19 year old. Just do your best to live in this very quiet, limited way and, and maybe you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it, it, I didn't start the research um, on finding another path right away, but it definitely in my mind, never, never did I see that as the end all be all. And so go ahead. Did you want to uh, ask? How did your family respond to this? Your parents, like you're 19, you're still, you know, sure you're an adult, but you're still kind of under the jurisdiction kind of thing of your parents. What was their reaction? What was their guidance? <laughs> um, you know, they were in a panic. <laughs> uh. um, 
I, my, my greatest memory of my mother is just standing. I was laying on uh, the table at the orthopedic surgeon's office and my x-rays were up on the screen. And my mom just, I remember seeing her face. She was just bereft. You know, she would just wring her hands and she wasn't a powerless person, but it was a pretty significant thing to see for such a young person. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, were they protective? Did they say, don't move, don't, don't breathe kind of thing? Like what was the, what was the, the overall sense in your home about how to deal with you in this condition? Well, there was a little bit of don't move, don't breathe. There was also a little bit of, well, this is the new normal now, so we got to get on with it. You know, I took um, a few steroid uh, med raw packs and I was on painkillers, not opioid painkillers, thank God, but I was on painkillers and um, I had to go back to college. You know, I mean, I had come home from college because of this acute pain incident, but after Christmas break, I had to go back. So it was kind of like, we're not going to get dramatic, but this is the way your life is going to be. Hmm. So you're in college during this experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the age of 19, you're supposed to be, you know, sure, studying, sitting in a chair, doing your studying, but also doing a little playing. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm imagining that that all was affected quite dramatically. Yes, it was very upsetting. And probably the reason that I ended up having such a strong desire and impetus to find another solution for myself was my inability to accept that my life was going to be that limited. I, I just, it, it's something in me couldn't accept it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at what point did you start searching for something? Well, uh, uh, the story goes that I actually completed college and I was in grad school. I was living in the Midwest at the time and my mother was watching the Rosie O'Donnell show. And Rosie, when she had a regular talk show, and Rosie had a producer named Jeanette Barber, and she had a segment called Fix Jeanette, because Jeanette was in a motorized wheelchair, and she had tried everything and been to every doctor, and she had, I think, knee and foot pain so severe that she was no longer walking, and she said, we can't figure out what's wrong with Jeanette. She asked the audience, she asked the greater audience, and people wrote back, Dr. John Sarno. And my mother called me and she said, you must read this book. And at the time he has, he has three best-selling books at the time he, or four rather, but at the time he had written healing back pain. And that's what I began to read. Okay. And what made his material different than anything else you had ever seen? And how old were you at that point? Now I'm in my mid twenties. Okay. And, um, his material basically said this, and he's a, a very brilliant medical doctor uh, at the time, he was an attending at the Rusk Center for Rehabilitation at NYU Medical Center. So he had a lot of credibility and he had been practicing there for many, many years. I think at that point, maybe 30 years. And he said, we all have structural abnormalities. He called them normal abnormalities. He said, if you took 100 people off the city streets and you MRI'd them, just as many people would have an abnorm abnormality that didn't report back pain than did. He mm -hmm. said, our 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 crazy epidemic of chronic pain in this society is is misunderstood and that the pain although there can be a weak point in in your body if you do have a structural abnormality where the mind the brain and the nervous system could be sending pain signals as a result of these repressed emotions it isn't necessarily because of your abnormality that you suffer in pain and i said hmm okay you know that's really interesting to me let me see what he proposes you do um, well, but wait a second. If if the pain doesn't come from abnormality, what does it come from? So essentially, the am I jumping ahead here? Um, no, it doesn't. You know, we can jump all over the place because okay. all roads all roads lead to the truth, in my opinion. Um, if you have you know good intentions, and we certainly do. Okay. Um, so okay, here's the deal, and this is what I this is what I I teach in my entire practice. Sometimes we feel things in our hearts and sometimes we feel things in our bodies. And I've been doing this now, this work with myself and with other people, many thousands of them around the world for over 20 years. And I found this to be true in every case once people get in the right mindset, which is my back pain could be her anxiety. Her anxiety could be his irritable bowel syndrome. His irritable bowel could be her migraines. Her migraines could be his shoulder pain. What do you mean his and her? Meaning anybody out there that walks, it's the human condition that we suffer from different physical pains, that we suffer from different psychic and emotional pain. And really they're all expressions of the same genesis, which is 
our nervous systems when there is a predator, and this is, you know, we're the same biological makeup as, as early man. We have a nervous system that seeks to protect us from a predator, sees our repressed emotions as a greater predator than a physical pain signal that's sent to the body. And there's many, many, you know, medical. Okay, doctors. say that in a way that the average person can understand. So, so when our nervous system experiences, can we call it stress? Sure. What happens in, again, I'm trying to translate, is that we find a way to cope with that emotion, oftentimes by repressing the emotion, by tucking it away, by hiding it. By stuffing it up somewhere. Out of necessity. Okay. It's a survival mechanism. Correct. And when we do that, it shows up as pain in our body. Well, the, that, that's almost there. You're missing one step, so I'll, I'll help clarify it a bit. Perfect. A bit. So I'm going to give an actual example because it's, I think it's easier for people to understand when we just talk about real physical human beings. So let's say, for example, you have a family reunion you need to go to. Yeah. And at that reunion is going to be your mother-in-law, who's always criticizing your parenting, and your sister, who everybody always liked better than you, in your estimation, and your you know, brother, who's got a drug problem, who stresses you out, right? So you're going to this thing, and you know that those people are going to be there. Mm -hmm. And you have years of feelings that just, you know, and this is so natural, by the way. This is not a pathological situation. This is every one of us. There are years of interactions with those people where you had no capacity to fully resolve the conflicts around it. So you dealt with what you could deal with and you repressed the rest, like you just explained, out of necessity, out of survival, right? There's a reason our defense mechanisms are called defense mechanisms. They help us, they defend us. And so you've repressed and you've repressed and you've repressed. Now it comes time for this family reunion. And maybe, you know, you're a person that's prone to migraines. Maybe that's one of the things that sometimes you struggle with here and there. And so all of this what uh, Dr. Sarno called this reservoir of emotions inside of you starts to bubble up because it, a lot is being added, all the stress of having to go and you're projecting what it's going to be like. And so it, it reaches critical, critical mass, you know, at the top of the reservoir and, it, and it, it threatens to spill over and inform you of exactly how terrifying and rageful and scary and embarrassing and ashamed all these feelings have made you feel. And they, re they reach the top and your nervous system gets a signal, which is there's a predator. There's a woolly mammoth in your peripheral vision, and it is these people and the feelings that they're connected with. And it sends a, a response system throughout, a response throughout your system, which is she needs protection. And the protection comes in a migraine because if the pain signals are sent there, what does it do? You get to lay down, you get to say you can't go, you turn off the lights, if you look at your mind-body system, if you look at, at, at evolution and what has kept us safe and alive, that's a much safer space to be than at your family reunion, where all of those people are making you feel a certain way. Now, although you and I would say, well, of course, it's, it's, that's not convenient, that's terrible, that's missing out on your life, but without the right perspective on it to help our bodies understand and align with us, that, that is what is seen as the safer option, and so many of us are living in that cycle. So you're saying that our bodies choose illness as a way to protect us from what you call the predator, a bad situation, a stressful situation. The repressed emotions associated with the stressful situation. Okay. So, so if that's the case, how do we reverse that? How do we, how do we deal with the stressful situation and how do we eliminate the headache? Well, here's the miracle of it that is the so closely aligned to your work, Kim. It's the journaling. So essentially, what I understood through my own chronic pain recovery, my first patient was myself. I understood through working with Dr. Sarno and through reading his work and through understanding this process that we're explaining right now, that I needed a way to safely feel my feelings, to really just get all that sludge up from down there that it had been repressed and bring it to light. And what's so interesting is people think if they think about dark things, they're going to feel worse. But when you unmask the, the truth about the things that you're frightened of, oftentimes, like we tell children, it just, it just evaporates away. You look your fear in the face and it, and it stops being as scary and as ugly as it was. 
So the process I teach people is called journal speak. And it's a specific journaling practice to bring safely and kindly and lovingly and with compassion, bring these repressed emotions to your conscious mind. And once they're there, the predator is no longer seen as predator because the predator was the rep repressed emotions that were unexplained and unseen. Once they're seen and revealed for what they are, you're safe to go anywhere. People in my practice don't need to change one thing in their lives. They don't go anywhere differently. They don't stop seeing people. They don't have pain because they have expressed and understood their repressed emotions. So you're saying the predator is the emotion that is repressed. It's not the sister-in-law or mother-in-law who's criticizing you. Correct. Got it. Okay. So tell me more about journal speak. What is that? How is that different from any other type of journaling? So, um, so if we're going back to my story, when I first realized that I needed to do this work and do it really hard, it's kind of skipping forward, but I, I, I healed my chronic pain through my understanding of this, but then I went on to do the things I was never supposed to do. I had two children mm -hmm. and I was married and I had my graduate degree. I had my uh, MSW and I was living in a house in the suburbs, all the things I've ever quote unquote dreamed of. And um, at that point I had another acute pain incident. And what was really troubling is that I thought, well, now this is real. You know, all that Sarno knowledge that I had from reading the book in my 20s went out the window, and I spent another year in terrible chronic pain, really, really dark. And after which, when I finally said enough is enough, and I went to see Dr. Sarno in person, that's when I really said, I have to do this work, and I have to do it for real. And he said, you should journal. And I sat down, and I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to save. I did it like I was saving my own life, and because I was. And so are you saying that before you didn't journal as rigorously? Like what, what was the change that just took place? Well, to be really honest with you, when I first found out about it, it was enough. I didn't journal at all. When I first found out about it, just the understanding that, wait a second, I'm not broken. Like I, it might be that my pain is, um, it's found a weak spot in my structural abnormality, but it's not because I'm broken. Uh, that knowledge and kind of the way it, it, it um, calmed me and relieved me was sort of enough. And I, I might have had like a little pain here and there, but it, it started to tell me my life wasn't going to be this awful jail in which I sit. And so that was enough for the first few years. But once I had the babies and I really got scared, that was when I had to do the program full on. And that's when I started the journaling. Okay. Okay. So tell me about the process of this journaling. You, you call it journal speak. What is that about? So I'll tell you about the day Journal Speak was born. Okay. So I was told to journal. There was, you know, Dr. Sarno, um, he passed away, by the way, a year and a half ago at the age of 94. Um, and he was a fantastic and amazing genius. But what he didn't do very well is explain things, which is where I'm kind of take the, taking the baton from him. He didn't explain exactly how to do it. So he did say, you know, you should journal. Journal about your feelings 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. And I said, Okay. And I was, I've always been a real type A, you know, uh, a student perfectionist, which is part of the problem. And I sat down with my list and the instructions were to make three lists, childhood, daily life, and personality. And to just bullet out the things that you thought were uh, potentially causing you to have fear, anxiety, rage, et cetera. So, so you make these three lists and then you're supposed to journal on them. So I was sitting there doing my work and I put motherhood at the top of the page. And at the time I had a two year old and a few months old, they're 22 months apart, my two oldest. And I started writing, I started journaling and I started saying, I'm really tired. I have two babies in cribs. I have two babies in diapers. This is hard for me. And I had an epiphany at that moment. It was like a moment of grace. And I said, I'm lying. And of course I wasn't really lying because I did have two babies and I did have two cribs, but there was something in my story that I know wasn't going to be the truth that heals me, wasn't going to get those repressed emotions and dig them up and get them out. And I took a breath and I wrote, I hate being a mother. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you that I've been the kind of kid that, that swaddled my stuffed animals since I was 10 years old, motherhood was my goal. Motherhood was the end all and be all of what I decided was going to be my happiness. And I wrote it 
And I stared at it at the page and I knew that this is where I needed to go. So was that the truth? Well, what's interesting about journal speak is it doesn't stay the truth. Journal speak is saying, okay, saying yes, saying yes to that little five-year-old inside all, all of us who really just wants to be heard. Who, who stopped having temper tantrums maybe when she was five, but now she's in a 35-year-old body and just has to repress every time she has a feeling that's just a human visceral feeling. And that's really what builds our reservoirs of rage and sadness and fear. And so I just let her talk. Mm -hmm. So you let her talk and did you believe her? Did, on any level, did you say, yes, this is actually my truth. I want to give up parenting. I want to, you know, let someone else take care of my kids and I want to go to Italy. <laughs> I mean, listen, I have five kids now and that is, would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, no, no. Another uh, thing we have in common, by the way. Uh, do you have five kids? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we could talk about that in another podcast. That's right. Uh, so, so this is really what, this is what happens with journal speak. And by the way, it's the most beautiful, the most heart opening thing I've ever done in my life. It does not stay dark. I said, I hate being a mother. And then I let it rip. And this is important. And I said, and I will not repeat, you know, any sort of profanity here, but you have to really give yourself permission. You know, I feel this way. I feel that way. This is, you know, I had the wrong baby because, you know, this is really being honest that, that my daughter was not the, you know, silly little fantasy that I had as a 10 year old. She was difficult and she was opinionated and she looked like my ex-husband. <laughs> he was my husband at the time. Right. And um, another she, thing we have in common. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of those things where this voice, you know, what I say often to my patients and to my, you know, where I, when I speak all over the world is I say this, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it make a sound? And my answer is yes makes a sound, it thunders down every time, whether you're listening or not. So if you have these feelings inside you and you don't have a vehicle to bring them to light, it's going to make a sound in your migraines or in your back pain or in your irritable bowel or in your skin disorders or whatever chronic pain you suffer with. If you'll just listen to it, there is no need for it to make that sound anymore all over your body. So when I was doing my journal speak, yeah, I said a lot of really ugly things. And then after I finished hating my kids, I started with, I hate my parents. Now, this is all probably within 15 minutes. I hate my parents. You know, they gave me such a difficult time when I was a kid. So, of course, I'm trying to heal my wounds with these kids. And then it morphed to, I hate myself. Why well, was such I, I such a naive fool that I thought that having babies was going to be this easy? And as soon as I was done with all that temper tantrum, screaming, ugly, dark stuff, I felt my heart just split wide open. And I realized I don't hate my kids and I don't hate my parents. I, and I certainly don't hate myself. I found compassion for everyone just by acceptance of what is. And that's when I began to transform. So, so how did it actually, so you gave your repressed emotions a voice. Yeah. So explain to me the relationship again. And I know you did but I want to hear it again, <laughs> between repressing your emotions and pain. Okay. So let's go back to our example of the person with the migraine and the family reunion. If instead of getting into bed and saying, I'm not going for the day, that person had these, this journal speak tool, understood this and said no, and said to her, her husband, her spouse, or whatever family, give me an hour, and said, sat down and said, I'm scared. I'm scared to go. Because aunt so-and-so, she always makes me feel so bad about myself. And I remember that time when I was 10, when I couldn't stop crying and, you know, whatever. And, and my sister, you know, Jane, they always liked her better. And I know I feel that way. And it's embarrassing to say it, but, you know, whatever. So that's journal speak. That's an example of journal speak. And, and tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. Get angry, get sad, get scared, cry, whatever you need to do. That migraine would either never come or would go away because when you express the repressed emotions, the nervous system doesn't kick up into fight or flight, doesn't feel the reason to keep you from going there. Mm -hmm. You're in alignment. You're in equilibrium. You go from fight or flight to rest and repair, and you can go anywhere and do anything you want because the emotions are what you're defending against, not the situation. 
So let's talk about what kind of pain it heals. Is it specifically chronic pain? Is it, let's say someone has uterine fibroids. I don't know. I'm picking something out of a a hat. Could it heal that? Well, that's a very interesting question. You know, that, that, that is a question that is much debated in my field. And here's what I will say about it. There is no cure for human pain. We are human and we will feel pain because I really contend sometimes we feel things in our hearts and sometimes we feel things in our bodies. And so you would, not you, but one would never argue that a comedian who's about to go on stage and throws up, it's not that he has stomach cancer. It's not that he has a, you know, a tumor. It's that he's scared and he threw up. You know, we have a physical response sometimes to an emotional situation. Sometimes mm-hmm. we have a really stressful day and we have a headache. It doesn't mean we have a brain tumor. We have a headache. It's been a stressful day. So that's really the same thing I'm talking about. I'm just talking about when it becomes chronic. Now, if you have uterine fibroids, in my opinion, that has been Because first of all, probably you are predisposed to uterine fibroids, just like I do have a structural abnormality in my back. You could feel it if you put your finger down my spine. I mean, have Mm it. It hasn't gone away, hasn't cured it. So, I mean, you know, maybe you do have a predisposition, but probably the level of fight or flight you've been in for years and the amount of fear that has been imposed upon you by many doctors telling you you have these fibroids and the meaning you've assigned to it, maybe I won't be able to have children. Ooh, I felt a twinge of pain. That's probably my fibroids. You know, fear is really the fuel for chronic pain. Chronic pain is an epidemic of fear. And so I can't say that my work would make the fibroids no longer in your uterus. But if you did, let's say, have fibroids that were, that were so um, significant, they were obstructing your ability to get pregnant, let's say you had them removed, if you did my work, you probably wouldn't get them back. Right. It's about creating the situation that the body needs to protect us from these repressed emotions to such an extent that it causes a physical problem that is a safer thing for us to handle. So... Uh- You know, one of the things that strikes me, I mean, I've experienced it myself. My method of coaching is a little uh, different. It's a little out there. I imagine that you're taking that even to a higher level, that people might feel like, what is she, what is she inventing, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how have you, what have you heard and how have you dealt with that? Well, Here's what I will say. I have been doing this. I, I wrote the book. I wrote my, my book. Uh, it's called The Meaning of Truth. And I wrote it several years ago. And the reason I wrote it is because so many people were healing and it was so breathtaking. And I mm-hmm. thought more people need to understand this. This can't just be my private practice, you know. And I wrote the book and the feedback I got was this can't possibly work for everyone. And what I say, and when I when I lecture, I always say, this might not work for everyone, but I catch someone's eye in the audience and I say, but I'm telling you right now, it can work for you. This needs to be, even though someone can feel skeptical about it, it needs to be a decision that if you're suffering enough and if you choose to try something different to suffer, to not suffer anymore, I say, do a science experiment on yourself. Try this work. It doesn't hurt. It can't possibly hurt you. And it's not, it doesn't cost any money, especially if you use the free resources that I have out there. You know, of course, there, there's a course, and there's a book if you want to spend money, but you don't have to. And what happens to people is they start doing the work and they're like, oh my God, I didn't, I, you know, I haven't had back pain. It's been three hours. I haven't felt my back pain. And I say, yep, that's how it starts. And then they keep doing the work and then it happens for days. And now something that used to take up all of their energy, which is worrying about their health, going to doctor's appointments, worrying they were going to get addicted to pain meds, that's all over for them. And they're just living their life. So what I say is, how long do you want to suffer? Is it worth your life to try something different? You have a good point. What do you have to lose, really, is is your message. My message is, what do you have to lose? But my message is also, this is not conjecture. This is fueled by thousands. And if you count Dr. Sarno's work, millions of people that are living absolutely free lives Mm -hmm. that used to be. I I have patients that crawled through my door on disability seven, eight years out of work that are now back to work full time without chronic pain. I mean, isn't it worth it? it it's definitely worth it. So, so let's review the, the assignment. You have three categories, childhood, daily life, and personality. And what do you do when you journal? You write about all three, you pick one. How does it work? 
Well, when people are first getting started, it's just a nice uh, structure for them to have that they begin their work. So childhood, daily life and personality, you just bullet it out. So for childhood, um, it could be, you know, that time in third grade when everybody left me out when I moved after seventh grade, you know, it only has to make sense to you. It's just a bulleted list. Personality is, you know, for me at least, perfectionist, goodest. I want to be approved of. I want to be seen as a good person. You know, I I get scared when my kids are suffering. I want to control their lives to make them happy. You know, like you bulleted out things about you that could Mm -hmm. be causing you stress. And then daily life is your finances, your spouse, your, you know, ailing parent, your dog, your kids, you know, everything that goes into daily life. And so if the best, the way to start is to peruse your lists. And I always say the thing that pops up that you think, Oh God, I don't want to think about that one. Start there (laughs) (laughs) and, um, and just set your, um, timer on your phone or whatever timer you have for 20 minutes, turn it over. So you're not looking at it and you just invite with love and kindness and compassion, that little kid, that five-year-old voice, sometimes it's a very mature voice, but it's immature in terms of its ability to, you know, it's an impulsive voice. It's sometimes angry. It's sometimes terrified. Tell the truth. Invite that voice inside you to tell the real truth. Don't worry about societal expectations. Nobody's going to read it. I often instruct people to destroy their journal speak as soon as they're finished because it's a, pr- it's a process. It's not an end result. You don't have to ever show this to anyone. Some people, like you said, like to email me their journal speak if they're comfortable or like to share it with their therapist. That's their prerogative. But the practice that allows your body to heal only needs to be seen by you. Mm -hmm. And what about if the journal has like self berating in there? What if like the journal says something like, oh, you're an idiot. You should have solved this problem. You're not smart enough. All that jazz, whatever it is. I think that's beautiful. Because if that's in if that's in your thoughts that need to come out, that means that tree is falling anyway all mm-hmm. the time. We know how self loathing works, right? It's toxic, right? And so I I want to address a term you've been using is tell the truth. So it's 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 a tricky word, right? Because truth is a little bit uh, it's biased. In other words, uh, it's you know from my perspective, there's no such thing as the truth. There is the truth I breathe to life, right? So I could call myself stupid, for example, for not achieving a goal or dumb or uh, lazy or whatever those words are, that doesn't make it the truth, but it makes it the truth that I'm living with right now. Yes. And that's a really excellent point because the truth that you're living with right now is what needs to be said. It will always morph. You're right. Truth is fluid. Truth is relative. And so if right now, Okay, I'll give like a, an example that many women face. Let's say I'm feeling fat. I'm feeling bad, my body image right now, right? And oh. it's keeping me from getting out there. It's keeping me, well, then I might have to write at the top of the page. I'm fat. I'm gross. I hate how I look. I just caught my glimpse in the mirror and look at my butt. You know, whatever a woman or a man or anyone might feel in that moment, it doesn't stay true. But if it's, if it's, if it's what you think you feel, hiding from it doesn't help. And what often happens is, you start to morph within the journal speak session. You know, I could start there and I could be like, but you know what, actually, I'm really strong and I actually feel really great. And, you know, I've been eating really healthy lately. Like sometimes it starts to morph or sometimes you come to, you know what, I'm not going to sabotage myself one more day. Sometimes it comes to empowerment. I do feel fat. And you know what, I'd like to start exercising. It's good for me. Or whatever it brings you to, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. must start with whatever, wherever you're at. You know, social work, the mantra of social work, Um, is start where the client is at, you know, start where you're at. So sometimes where I'm at on one day is I hate everybody. I wish everybody would leave me alone. So I just start there. It never stays that way. I love my kids. I love my family, but I don't always want them in my face. And maybe in that moment, (laughs) I'm feeling that way. Right. So I I mean, I have a philosophy of a lot of people say, you know, how should I journal? And I, I kind of compartmentalized it or balled it up into an easy to understand or easy to remember method, which is dump, dump, and then dump the dump. <laughs> and, Similar. And, and so so the idea is like, get it all out. And when you think you're done, no, keep going. Like mm. really, really unload, express yourself, 
uh, say what's on your mind, say, you know, those, you know, write down the deep, dark, ugly stuff that's in your brain. And then at some point, decide that you're, you're, you know, you've, you've expressed it, right, that it's out. And then what you want to do is kind of say, okay, it's time to turn myself around. Where am I going now? Where do I want to be? Where do I want to land? Where do I want to stay? Where do I want to head? How do I want to solve this problem? Like, where do I want to leave myself? Yeah. And for me, that component is 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 uh, important because you're using your journal to take your emotional self to a new place. Absolutely. And I actually think that process happens very naturally. I'll often find when I'm doing my own journal speak practice that I do begin with dump, dump and dump again. And that I end up in that very hopeful place. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So how do people find you if they need your help? Well, let's see. There's lots of places to find me. My website is the best place to start, which is thecureforchronicpain.com. Um, my name is Nicole Sachs, as you said. So if anyone Googles me or The Cure for Chronic Pain, they will find it. I also have a YouTube channel called The Cure for Chronic Pain with Nicole Sachs LCSW with a lot of free information on it. Um, on Facebook, I have a closed group that I, um, I run. And it's clo- totally closed, so um, you have to ask to be to join. And once you're in the group, everything you write will only be seen pe- by people in the group. So it's a lovely community. It's called Journal Speak with Nicole Sachs, LCSW. Um, I have a book on Amazon. It's called The Meaning of Truth. tells the story that I kind of touched on today in great detail and tells you uh, exactly how to do this for yourself. Um, and also very, very exciting for me. Um, I was just invited to run a five day retreat at the Omega Institute in upstate New York, um, next summer. And that more details will be coming of that. But if people wanted to join us, it's going to be five days, totally transformational. I've titled it from chronic pain to celebrating life. And that's going to be uh, next July 21st at the Omega Institute. So July 21st. Yes. July 21st through the 26th next summer at Omega. It takes a long time to put these things together because when you, I don't know if you've heard of Omega, but you live there, you know, it's like a campus yeah. and yeah. it's beautiful. I've heard of it. It's absolutely, um, it's a magnificent place to be. So I'm very honored to have been invited. That's very exciting. I'm going to keep my eye on that. And when there's information, please send it to me. I certainly will. Yeah, the Omega um, uh, calendar, and um, you can't really sign up till March when the Omega calendar comes out, but I'm starting to talk about it because it's something that people definitely need to plan for in advance and maybe save up for. So it's a good thing for Right, right, right. All right. So as we round the corner of this interview, I have a final question. You've got a coach on the line. It's funny for a therapist to talk to a coach, but okay. Uh, Is there a question that you have for this coach? Well, actually, I love talking to coaches and other therapists because I'm never done learning. And so I I love that. Um, My question for you, Kim, would be, how do you help people when they experience a lot of rejection? Because I know that in my career, you know, my work does not make a lot of money for people. It's not like big pharma or the surgical model. And I have been rejected many, many times over. I submit and I just either don't hear anything thing or I hear a no. And so how would you help people keep going when the road is really hard like that? So, you know, for me, I, I, I like to hear the stories of rejection. Like I like to specifically hear the story that causes, I'm going to use your term pain, right? Like what's the story that hurts the most? And the reason I like to hear those stories is because in the telling of the story lies underneath it all your beliefs about yourself, about how the world perceives you, about your mark in the world, about what you're meant to do, about what, how hard it is. And what I do is I look at those beliefs with you. I, first of all, I bring them to light. I, I, I bring them forward, right? Like I unveil them and I say, are these the beliefs you have? And you might say, yes, those are exactly my beliefs. Or you might say, no, they're a little more like this. Mm -hmm. The point is we get to the heart of the matter because it's the beliefs that cause the problem. Otherwise, a rejection is rejection. You had a no before. It's the same. No, nothing changed. Right. right? (laughs) Good point. Like nothing actually changed. Like, you know, your your life didn't change dramatically with that no, but you make it mean something. And the meaning you attribute to it is what causes the pain. And so what we do is we look at that meaning and we, we convert that meaning into something a lot more useful. 
Yeah. And when, when it's converted into something more useful, number one is your strategy changes, but so does your emotional reaction when you get that no. Right. So I'll tell you a very quick story. Years and years and years ago, I knew a gentleman who sold not only sold real estate, but trained other real estate agents how to sell real estate. And he had this philosophy. He made cold calls and he'd call up and say, you know, I understand you're selling your home uh, for sale by owner, but I can sell your house for you. And if he would get a rejection, he'd say, thanks, I just made five dollars. And the person on the other end of the phone would say, what do you mean? He's like, well, let's do the math. You know, if I call 100 people, I'll get one listing. Mm -hmm. And that one listing represents X number of dollars divided by 100 phone calls. Every phone call I make, doesn't matter what the response is, is five bucks. So every time I call, I think five bucks, five bucks, five bucks. Doesn't matter what you're doing, matters what I'm doing. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's a good perspective shift. Right. And so what happens when you start taking the action is your action starts to be independent of the outcome. Your action starts to be independent of the result you're getting. And, and, and really at the end of the day, when your energy shifts, you start to meet like-minded people like we just did today. Yeah. Right. It's, and when, and when you meet like-minded people, you don't get rejected. Well, I think that is a really great answer. And I will tell you, I'm going to take that to heart. And I'm going to do a little journaling myself on remembering and maybe telling the story so I can see it out there about some of the more painful times I've been rejected and try to find what kind of meaning I've created out of it. Thank you for that. And Nicole, I know this is a really crazy offer specifically to you. But if you want someone to read your journal and work with you on it, I might be a good candidate for that. Absolutely. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, for sharing your story, for telling people how to journal, and for giving some measure of hope to the connection between really your thinking, the way you process things, and the way you feel, right? Your, your, your emotional state creates a physical outcome, and that there's hope that we can change it without medication, without surgery, without uh, treatment you know, in the traditional sense. So I'm really excited about that. I really hope we stay in touch. I hope that somehow even we get a chance to collaborate down the road. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you for having me, Kim.